Hi everyone, welcome back. I'm Michael Sandler, your host on Inspire Nation. If you've ever wanted more inspiration and motivation in your life, or wondered where in the world the marathon really came from, or who in the world was Pheodipides, then do we have the Road to Sparta show for you. Today I'll be talking with Dean Karnazes, one of my all-time favorite runners, and according to Time Magazine, one of the 100 most influential people in the world. He's also the New York Times best-selling author of Ultra Marathon Man, and has just released a historic new book, The Road to Sparta. And that's just what I want to talk with him about today, about an epic run that inspired the world's greatest foot race. That plus we'll talk about a field of fennel, running in silk underwear, the power of sea buckthorn, 75 miles without food, watching yourself on, from on high, what in the world a cataleptic nocturnal locomotion, and how do you run with a watermelon. So welcome to the show, Dean. Woohoo! For having you on the show. And before we dive into things, who was Gus Gibbs and what was his epic tale? Uh, boy, you really did your homework and I appreciate it. So uh, Gus Gibbs was my namesake. Uh, my actual name is Constantine Nicholas Carnassus. Mm -hmm. uh, Dean is just a nickname. So my grandfather um, immigrated to the U.S. when he was 14 years old, back at the turn of the century, uh, turn of the 19th century. And he used an alias name. His name was the same as mine, Constantine Nicholas Carnassus. But there was a stigma associated with immigration and immigrants. So he adapted a U.S. name, Gus Gibbs. And that is what he was known by until I looked at his death certificate and saw that it did not say Gus Gibbs, but Constantine Nicholas Carnassus. Very cool. And if we back up the story quite a bit, uh, I was very interested in how he climbed up a ladder to propose to your, well, you tell us. Yeah, so he <laughs> fell in love. He, he ended up uh, coming through immigrations at Ellis Island, as did many immigrants, and he moved to Los Angeles. He fell in love with a young lady, and he went to her house at night to propose to her. Uh, he climbed up to her window and proposed, and she said, I, I will not marry you. And he said, why is this? You, you love me. We, we you know, had a beautiful relationship. He said, well, she said, well, my, my oldest sister is not married yet. And I, it would be very disrespectful if I was to marry you and she hasn't married. So he moved over a couple of windows, found her older sister and proposed to her instead. And she climbed out the window and they eloped that night. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> and then if we go to... <laughs> A person's end of their life can say as much about their say much about their whole life, and you shared in the book what happened to him, kind of with his his dying breaths, that shared kind of his well strength or vigor that he had. Yeah, my grandfather was uh, from an area a region known as uh, Sparta in Greece, and uh, he was a warrior at heart, and he would. He would not accept defeat in any possible way. I mean, the Spartans were the Spartan boys were taught two things: uh, never retreat and never surrender. So every fight was until you either you know ended up dead or until you won. And he had a massive coronary in his basically in his living room uh, after coming home from playing tennis, and he fought it. He fought his body. He said, you know, my arm is not working. His arm went completely numb, and he asked his wife. Uh, to bring him a knife so he could cut off his arm and they could just go about their day. So he's a, he a very bullheaded man, a very tough man. And he, you know, he lived a very, um, a very rich life, a very rich and colorful life. And that was the end of it. So, and it sounds like a little bit of that, well, for lack of another term, we'll, we'll call it tenacity showed up <laughs> in you as well. <laughs> I haven't threatened to cut off my arm yet, but I've done some pretty crazy things, yeah. Uh, I remember my bike ride across the country. We talked about that in the last interview uh, a few years back. Uh, when I was interviewed by a, a journalist who said, there's no way you're going to make it. And I said, well, if I have to, if I can't pedal with my legs anymore, I will grab the pedal with my teeth and I will pull it around. And I imagine you would do much the same thing. In fact, we'll get to your, your epic adventure, one of many, in just a little bit. But maybe we can talk about your ultra endurance training that started in the Greek Orthodox Church. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, running is about discipline, isn't it? It's about focus. It's about commitment. And I remember when I was a little boy, I used to go to church. And I, this is when I was five, five years old, five and six years old. And the sermon is delivered in Greek, in a Greek Orthodox church. And my Greek was pretty poor. I was in Greek school learning Greek at the time. 
Uh, I didn't understand what was being said. And let's face it, the Bible, um, how many five and six year olds can comprehend the Bible at all? And I would sit there for hours just trying to master my body, just trying to force myself to sit still. I mean, what five and six year old boy wants to sit still? We want to run wild, go crazy, be loud. And I, I said, you know what? Master your body, master your mind by sitting still and paying attention. And I'll never forget, I used to look around to my sides and there'd be people passing out, just <laughs> falling asleep. And I would sit there just at attention, riveted, watching this sermon, uh, just to prove to myself I could do it. I wonder where that came from. Yeah, it's, it's funny. Um, you know, people used to say to my, my mother, you know, he, he's going to be a priest. He loves this stuff so much. <laughs> and I thought, that I don't even understand this stuff. I don't love it. There's just something about me that loved the discipline of mm -hmm. challenging. Could I sit still for two or three hours and listen to something I didn't understand? You take us forward from there. It's about that same time to a kindergarten foot race. Yeah, so um, I remember running when I was a young boy. And I remember there was going to be a race uh, around the school track. And it was four laps. And I would say it was probably the equivalent of a mile, maybe a little bit further because the schoolyard wasn't actually a track. It was just a big circular yard. And I remember we were racing against uh, first and second graders as well. And I was a kindergartner, so I was a few years younger. And I just remember playing around the schoolyard and that I wasn't the quickest guy. I remember other kids could out, out sprint me, definitely. They could get to a ball quicker than I could. But I remember that I never really got tired that much. So the starting gun went off, and we all started running around the track, and I was somewhere around mid-pack. And then I noticed kids starting to walk after about one lap. I mean, they sprinted out, typical, mm -hmm. and ran out of energy. And then I remember the second lap, it got a little bit thinner. The force got a little thinner, like I could see some light. There was fewer kids kind of left in front of me. And by the third lap, I thought, there's, there's just one person in front of me. And soon I, per you know, I passed that one individual, and by the fourth lap, I was out all by myself, ahead of the entire group. A lot of the kids were walking or even sitting down on the sides. And I came across in first place. And I, I didn't think much of it. I just thought, well, I just kind of outlasted everyone. I mean, they're, they're faster than me. They went out quicker, but I got to the, the finish line first. And it was a, a, a strange occurrence. And I just remember the, uh, the teachers, after they got us all back in the classes, mm -hmm. Uh, were looking at me like, wow, that was kind of amazing. I didn't, I didn't think much of it. I mean, I was again, I was five or six years old. I was in kindergarten, but I remember they were looking at me, and I couldn't tell. Did they think I was strange, or were they inspired, or what it was? But I just remember that event very clearly. Very, very cool. And so after that, I don't know how long or how soon after that, but your dad had told you about uh, what, who we call Philippides and and it's pronounced Pheidippides, I believe, in, in Greek. What did he tell you about him? Well, and you know, to back to uh, to your pronunciation of his name. Um, that's the thing with Greece. There's a lot of ways to say the same thing, and so there's Pheidippides, Pheidippides. There's some, um, some spellings have an L in there, so Philippides, um, but basically he's the first marathoner. And my dad said that, you know, the, the Persians had invaded Greece back in 490 BC, and after the, the Athenians somehow defeated the Persians, mm -hmm. uh, they sent a foot messenger to run to announce victory. And this man ran up to the Acropolis and he proclaimed, you know, Nike, Nike, or Nike, Nike, which means victory, victory. We are victorious. And, and then he died. And my dad told me this story. And I don't know if he was trying to be a tragedy, you know, if it, it was a tragedy he was telling me or an epic. But I viewed it as how heroic this, this man fulfilled his life mission. Uh, they, def you know, they defeated the Persians in battle. He ran and he, he got to the Acropolis as a hero and then he died. And I thought, there's no more glorious story to be told than that one. I remember that very clearly. I was just, you know, again, I was just a, a young teenage boy. And how did that affect your high school fundraiser? <laughs> well, I got in my head that I was going to try to run a marathon um, when I was 14. And not just any marathon, but I was going to run around the school track as a fundraiser. And we, you know, we kids, I was uh, a sophomore in high school at the time, we collected pledges per mile, and I remember people were pledging, you know, a dollar per mile. And most kids ran, you know, five or ten. I'm sorry, a dollar per lap. Most kids ran, you know, five or ten laps, and it's around the track. So four laps is basically a mile. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I decided I was going to run 105 laps, which is 26 point, you know, three miles. And <laughs> it took me, I, I can't, I, I wasn't keeping a track of how long it took me, but it was probably close to, you know, uh, five or six hours, I would say somewhere in that range. And that was the first time I ran a marathon. Very, very, very cool. And, um, <laughs> what were the donors like afterwards? <laughs> <laughs> I remember going around the neighborhood, knocking on people's doors, like, uh, you know, they'd say, how much do I owe? And I'd say, well, $105. And they'd say, what? $105. Yeah, I had some problems collecting. Yeah. That, yeah. Yeah, I can imagine. So you you went from there, though you didn't exactly uh, embrace the running shoes. You went to Australia for surfing, if I understand right. Yeah, well, I was from California, and um, you know, I, I my, the the real genesis of the story is that the cross country coach that I loved, he retired, and he was more like a mentor, more like a sage. I mean, he used to just say, "Run with your heart," you know, "Run off into the hills for as long as you want." And I love that approach. And then the, the track coach uh, took over the cross-country program, and he was very regimented. And I remember he had us on the track running intervals, you know, doing all the kind of things that someone you know, running track does. But I was a cross-country guy, and it just it didn't appeal to me. So I thought, who needs this? And I stopped running. And that was uh, at age you know, 14, right after running a marathon. And then I was an exchange student. I moved to Australia, and you know, my other passion was surfing. So I just start, you know, jumped into surfing. With all of my uh, all of my heart, yeah. awesome. And then I, this one just surprised the heck out of me. What did your calves have to do with anything? <laughs> you got to read the book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So ironically, um, if you look back into uh, into Greece, um, there's a lot of Greeks that immigrated to the U.S. and a lot that immigrated to Australia. Uh, in fact, Melbourne, Australia has the largest. Greek population outside of Athens. Huh. Uh, well, ironically, my um, my father, my grandfather's sister, so my great aunt, she immigrated to Australia, and we completely fell out of touch as families. In fact, we had no idea that we had relatives in Australia. Um, we knew that my grandfather had left his village, his hordeo, in Greece when mm -hmm. he was fourteen years old, and completely lost contact with his family. I mean, the mail service in in Greece, if you go back to this village, is very primitive. Even today, it's primitive. You can't imagine back, you know, in, in the in 1910, 1915, what it was like. So there was very distinctive legs that these people from this area of Greece had. Uh, they looked kind of like a hybrid between a, a, a mountain goat leg and a Brahma bull leg, I would say. And someone spotted a, a kid walking around. Sydney, Australia, with that same sort of leg, that same sort of calf muscle. And they went back to my great aunt. They said, you know, there's, I saw someone walking around that looked, his legs looked just like your legs. And his calf muscles looked just like your calf muscles. And that seems crazy, doesn't it? So they went and they did some research and they found in the Sydney Morning Herald a story about me. And they saw my last name was Carnassus, which is the same last name as her my great aunt's maiden last name. And so they got in touch with me. And it ends up that it was a very beautiful story. That was the, you know, the, the reuniting of, of my family, if you will. Awesome. That is just so awesome. From there, let's go and let's talk about you came back to the States and instead of putting on your running shoes and, and saying, this is, these legs are part of my heritage, let's see what they can do, you started chasing something else, the American dream. Yeah, I did. I mean, you know, running completely lost a place in my life. And I thought, okay, you know, you need a college education. I was really the first uh, person in my family to get a college degree, besides my mom, who got a college degree later in her life. But I went through college, then I went through graduate school, and then I thought I need a business degree as well. So I got an MBA, mm -hmm. and I had a very comfortable job in San Francisco. Um, by all you know, measures, I was successful, if you will, as a lot of people define success. Uh, but I didn't feel very successful. I felt like uh, materially I had what I wanted, but I wasn't fulfilled internally. And that was kind of the state of my life when I reached 30 years old. And so on your 30th, well, actually, let's back up from your 30th before your 30th birthday. Um, something very telling, I wouldn't, uh, if you wouldn't mind sharing what happened to your sister, Perry, and how that affected everything? 
Yeah, well, you know, I had a, a younger sister, and uh, her name was Perry, and she was really my best friend. We had a very, a very um, honest relationship, a very pure relationship. And she, I don't know, she was, she was, her wisdom was well beyond her age. Um, she was, she just had this way about her and the way of stating things and the way of looking at life, just this perspective on life that was so holistic. And she just encouraged me. She said, you know, you love to run. Why don't you run? And I said, well, I, you know, what, I, what do you mean run? I mean, I can't run away from everything. She said, you know, do what you love. You love to run, run. And unfortunately, she was... Uh, tragically killed uh, the night of her 18th birthday in a car accident, and I was 21 at the time, and it it was horrible. It was the worst thing that's happened in my life. I went through all of the stages of uh, bereavement. You know, I was I was angry, I was hostile, I went into denial, and it took me about uh, a decade to really accept the fact that she was gone, and it was that was the reality, and to kind of come full circle and say, you know. What would she want? How would she want to view you? She wouldn't want to see you angry. She wouldn't want to see you unhappy. She would want you to be doing what you love. And that would be the best way to honor her life is to do just that. So the night of my 30th birthday, I decided to do just that. In silk box, or, well, I don't know if they were boxers, but silk underwear <laughs> nonetheless. Well, I mean, I, you know, uh, maybe some of your listeners or your viewers have you know, heard the story. But, yeah, I was in a nightclub uh, in a bar in San Francisco on my 30th birthday uh, drinking with my buddies. And I just had this epiphany around midnight that I was going to leave. And, you know, they said, where are you going? The night is young. I mean, let's have another round of tequila. And I said, no, I'm going to run 30 miles right now to celebrate my 30th birthday. And I walked out of the bar. And you're right. All I had was I didn't even have running gear. I mean, I had silk underwear on these silk uh, boxers and they were pretty comfortable actually so i <laughs> took off my pants and you know drunk and started stumbling off into the night and that changed the course of my life i mean i got uh, let's be honest though i got to about mile 15 and i started sobering up and it started to hurt and i thought what am i doing this is really <laughs> but it just felt right it felt like it was uh, my place in the universe and so i kept going it sounds like in many ways you you haven't come back. You found you found Dean out, out on the roads that night. Well, I think you know. I think every runner has a story, right? I've talked to thousands of runners across the globe, and there's always a point when someone says, "You know, I'm a runner," <laughs> and it, it's it's different points for different people. Uh, that night, to me, uh, was the start of my new life. Um, is the you know the reality that boy it's just running it's simple it's it's you know it's not sophisticated it's just a kind of a pure primitive act but it's what I love to do I can remember my point very clearly it was coming back I'd run my whole life but it was coming back after a near death experience and wanting the simplicity about of being out there of being connected to the earth of being connected to the area around me and not having anything in between me and my environment, and just getting out to experience that with my own two feet. Yeah, maybe that'll be my next book, is just uh, interviewing people across the world about their story, because there are really some very interesting stories. Um, you know, people, yeah, I could tell you some amazing things, but yeah, so, I'll save that for my next book, yeah. I, I like <laughs> it. So let's talk about how you, how did you find out about Ultras, or who did you hear about it from, and how did that blow your mind? Well, you know, after running 30 miles that night, I thought, wow, I ran beyond a marathon. Like, that is this, I thought maybe this is the furthest anyone has ever run, in, you know, throughout history. And, you know, I learned the real story when I was uh, running around San Francisco training one day. And, you know, I, I thought I was a pretty good runner. And I'm running up this very steep hill called Lover's Lane in San Francisco. And, and two guys just blast past me. I mean, I thought, this, this is incredible. How did these guys pass me? And they had hydration packs on, filled with stuff. And I thought, and they've got packs on as well. Thankfully, they stopped at the top of Lover's Lane and started doing push-ups. <laughs> so I approached <laughs> these guys, and I said, you know, what's going on? What are you training for? And they said, you know, nothing. We're running. You know, we're training. And I said, well, what are you training for? And they said, well, we're going to run a race. I'm like, well, you know, how long is the race? And they said, well, 50 miles. I said, what? You're going to run 50 miles? Okay, like, where are the hotels? You know, where do you camp along the way? 
And he kind of looked at me like, what are, you, what are you saying? What do you mean? We're going to run 50 miles. The gun goes off. You start running and you stop when you get to the 50 mile mark. And I couldn't wrap my head around it. I thought that that's impossible. A human being cannot run continuously for eight hours. That's the craziest thing I've ever heard. I got to try it. I just got to <laughs> try it. Just, it appealed to me right away. So I signed up for that 50 mile race. That and was they, my first, first official ultra. And how was it? <laughs> it was the toughest thing I'd ever done. I mean, it, it, uh, it, it, it rendered me basically useless, um, <laughs> physically and mentally. But I'll never forget, I got to the, to the tent at the finish. Somehow mm -hmm. I finished. And I saw those same two guys, and they were high-fiving inside the tent. They said, we qualified. We qualified. And I'm thinking, what did you qualify for? You know, the insane asylum? And they said, no, we qualified for the Western States 100-mile endurance run. And, and that, again, just obliterated my whole notion of what was possible. I said, is this 100 continuous miles or, you know, are there breaks along the way? And he said, no, it's the same format. The gun goes off and ideally you try to finish within 24 hours. You run over mountains, you cross streams. And I, I, again, I just, I didn't like driving 100 miles. I could not figure out how a human being could run nonstop for a hundred continuous miles. And something in me just said, I've got to try this. I've got to, I've got to see if I can do this myself. And so, okay, I, I can't resist. How did the hundred miles go? <laughs> well, now, this is back in the early nineties. So this is a, a while ago. And, uh, the hundred miler, uh, you know, overall it went pretty well up to about mile 99. <laughs> <laughs> and then I was, uh, I didn't think I could finish. I mean, I, I had one mile to go, mm -hmm. and uh, I was laying on the ground. I, you know, was cramping. Everything was was wrong. And I'll never forget my dad. You know, he just he held me, and he just said, uh, "You know, you you've got to keep going. Uh, you've got to crawl." He said, "You know, you you've got many more hours to go before the cutoff. Just crawl. Just do something." And I just started crawling. I just thought, just crawl up the road. <laughs> And, you know, and he was crying. I mean, my dad was, you know, he, you know, a father seeing their son like that would, I don't know, a lot of fathers might just say, wow, you know, it was a great attempt and, you know, maybe come back next year. And my dad didn't say that. He said, don't stop, go, keep going. And so I finished and I did decently. I mean, I finished in around 21 hours. I know I was like, I think I was 15th place overall, which kind of shocked me because I thought if I can do that well, with, you know, without knowing anything of what I was getting myself into, maybe if I trained a little bit better, I could, mm -hmm. I could improve my performance even further. Woohoo! <laughs> and <laughs> and I, I want to jump around a bit. Before I do that, though, he recognized in you a bit of your heritage, didn't he? Well, and he, you know, and he, let's be honest, he, he gave me back that same heritage by saying, keep going, instead of saying, okay, you know, where's the medic? Let's get this guy out of here. He didn't say that. He said, toughen up <laughs> and start crawling, buddy. You got a mile and you can do this. So, he, you know, he, I saw that in him and I, and I responded accordingly. So you, you went from the 100 miler. You did things like uh, bad water at 135 miles after that and in, in the not too cool 120, 130, maybe even higher temperatures of Death Valley. And then you signed up for a 12 person race. <laughs> Yeah, so you're right. I mean, I ran uh, the 100 miler, completed the Western States, and I signed up for the Badwater Ultra Marathon, which is 135 continuous miles. You're right across Death Valley, and you're right in the middle of summer when it gets real hot out in Death Valley. And I, I somehow finished the Badwater, mm -hmm. and I thought, well, I got to try to go further than 135 miles, but I couldn't find at the time an organized foot race that was further than the Badwater. But I did learn about this uh, this basically 199 mile. 12 person relay race and I thought maybe I'll do that but I'll just have a team of one <laughs> instead of 11 other teammates and so the race director I think he thought I was crazy when I contacted him and said can I can I try to do this all by myself but he said sure you can you can, we'll let you try it and so that's the first time I ran 199 miles that's another woohoo <laughs> so there's well, that was, you know that was uh, two nights without sleep and that was that was trying yeah, that was a whole other element of uh, exhaustion and endurance. 
how do you wrap your mind around, we all hit a period of exhaustion where, where we either want to throw in a towel or just walk the other way. How have you either trained your mind or maybe it goes back to when you were five in that Orthodox church to say, this is absolutely miserable right here. But there's something special waiting for me on the other side of misery. Let's just take another step. Yeah, I think it's, it is that discipline thing. I think that it's, it's mastering your mind, right? Because, you know, the body is telling you, it's sending you signals to stop. And you have to override those signals. And you have to believe that you can override those signals and get to the other side. And I think that's just, that's, that's a discipline thing. That's a focus and, and a discipline and a willingness uh, not to give up. Thank you. From, you talk about in the book... The illusion of finding balance, meaning that if we were trying to be good at everything, we never get to excel at one thing or maybe our one thing. What's that mean to you? Oh, well, I'll never forget my grandmother said, she, she said to me one time, you know, uh, she used to call me Dini, like Dini, Dini, you, you know, you can have anything you want, you just can't have everything you want. And I think that really speaks to the idea of focusing on those things you really want and you know, giving, giving up those things that are superfluous to that. And, and that's kind of what I've done. So I've said, you know, I'm going to be the best animal I can be, mm -hmm. uh, the best runner I can be, and everything I do is going to be focused on being just that. So I look at my life and the way I conduct my life through the filter of being the best animal I can be. And that has to do with, you know, training, obviously, cross-training, uh, diet, uh, sleep, also, interpersonal relationships. I think a lot of um, athletes overlook the, you know, having quality interpersonal relationships and how important that is uh, in your performance. And so all of these things uh, come together to make Dean who he is. I'm, I'm getting a bit of mind blown because I've never heard you say that before. I've never heard anybody, maybe many people have, maybe it's just you, but that's huge because a lot of what I talk about in the show is how we're, we're out of balance, meaning we, we work on, maybe we do work on our spiritual side, which is really important, or we work on having, quote, success, which can be valuable too, but there's the element of us as an animal where we think, I'm not, I'm not from nature, I'm, I don't even understand what that means, but I, like I heard somebody in New York City say a few years ago, I don't do nature. And <laughs> <laughs> like what? <laughs> but but we are animals. We we may be having a spiritual existence in an animal body, but let's why not try to figure out what this can do, what our our meat suit can do, or at least bring out the best of it for this lifetime while we're here. I I agree, and I I think you hit upon something that is um, so critical, especially at this time in, in human existence, and that is our relationship with nature. Um, I have a deep relationship with nature. I mean, I feel um, most at ease when I'm running on trails by myself out in nature. And so many people these days across the globe have no relationship whatsoever with nature. I mean, they live in cities and like your, you know, your friend or your acquaintance in New York said, nature to them doesn't really exist. I mean, they interact in, in concrete buildings with other people. They don't go, I mean, to, to go run on a trail by themselves in the woods is such a foreign thing, but it's part of what we are as humans, right? And, and I think that not having that experience makes your life less complete. I, I couldn't agree more. I was looking out the window today as, as I was prepping for this interview, and uh, I was watching the, the cherry tree right outside our house. And I know Jessica, my wife, and I are going to get to the trails after this. And I said, do you know what today is? She's like, <laughs> she lists off a bunch of things. I'm like, no, no, no. It's bloom day. I'm like, the cherry oh. tree is hitting maximum blossom. And she goes, no, actually, it's coming in another day or two. We've got more to go. Being out, in the, being out on the trails or being out in nature and being able to see the cycles of the season, I think, in a sense, connects us to the soul. Seeing that, that liveness, seeing things come to life, seeing them go dormant, and being connected to the cycle of the planet. I, I mean, I agree so entirely. And in fact... One of the things I like about running for 24 hours or 48 hours or even when I ran from Los Angeles to New York is that you get to experience the day outside. 
And how many people, even the people that are listening and watching this, how many of you have actually spent an entire day outside, even one, and I mean entirely outside, watching the sunset and watching it rise the next morning and being at night awake and experiencing the whole cycle of 24 hours. That's a, a very human experience that very few people in our modern world actually live. And it sounds entirely to me, and, and I've experienced that as, 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 as well, First off, the word peace comes to mind, but there's also a reset button. It's like it's reminding us who we are. Well, I, you know, I think a lot of people are probably being cynical and saying, well, why would I want to do this? It sounds horrible. You know, why, why don't I watch Netflix? I mean, that sounds like a lot more fun. Uh, but I would encourage you to try it once. It, it is a reset button. It's, it's so, it's cleansing is what I like to say. It's, mm -hmm. it's rejuvenating. It, it, it kind of, it, it changes who you are fundamentally. So your, your wife saw this in you as you're starting to train, as you're starting to get serious about this. Actually, it, it, and we're going to jump to Greece here in a minute, but what did North Face have to do anything? Because I think that was a, a switch that went off in your mind. Yeah, so the North Face is a company that a lot of people know of. It's, a, it's an outdoor brand. And they came to me at the end of a 100-mile foot race, at the end of Western States 100-mile uh, endurance run. And they said, you know, we want to design some shoes that are specifically for running on trails. Now, again, this is back in the, you know, the mid-90s. There weren't a lot of trail running shoes out there. I mean, mm -hmm. most, most people are just running in road shoes on the trails. And I thought, well, the North Face is not really known as a running company, but they are an outdoor company. I mean, you think of the North Face, you think of guys outside, you know, hanging from the side of mountains and, and doing incredible things in the mountains uh, on rugged trails and rough terrain. So I thought, you know, this makes sense. It makes a lot of sense. And it could be a way to shape my future. It could be a way to kind of carve out a living doing this thing I love. And again, that was um, back in, you know, the, the mid-90s. And I've been with the North Face ever since. Woohoo! Yeah. <laughs> and, and so you go to your wife at some point and you say, that's it. No moss. I'm leaving my day job that supported us and supported us well behind. And what did she say? Yeah, well, I mean, that was a scary moment because let's face it, if you've got a job, you know, you've got a pay, you've got a consistent paycheck, you have health care benefits. You know, I had a 401 matching, 401k matching program, stock options. I had a company car, all these perks. So and I you had kids. Walk, and I had kids. I had bills. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I was going to walk away from it all. And my wife, Julie, she said, I wonder what took you so long. So she was just so supportive. She just said, you know, that's, it's great you're making this decision now, <laughs> finally. Yeah. Well, she, she could see your heart. She could, and she wasn't worried. I mean, I was way more worried than her. I mean, I, you know, I was freaking out. Like, how am I going to make a go of this? This is, it's terrifying to do that. And anyone who's made that leap knows how scary it is. And for most people, uh, they don't make that leap. And I'm sure a lot of people listening and watching now are going to say, boy, there's something I'd really rather be doing than sitting at this desk right now or, you know, I, I, getting up tomorrow morning and going to work, to work where I'm going. I'd rather be doing something else. But to do that is, is frightening. It's really frightening. The question is, is it as frightening as fast forwarding, doing an exercise? You could literally do this as a homework exercise, everybody who's listening, and, and write out what you would say on the last day of your life, or if you're on, on your bed and what you would say. And would you say, I was too scared to do what my heart was telling me to do, or I don't even know how to put it. You, you and I would both say that that'd be the real fear. I think it's, it's, it's too, oh, am I, was I too comfortable? Mm -hmm. Was I too lazy to do what I really wanted to do? And I think that, you know, that, that state of quiet desperation, as Thoreau wrote about, is how a lot of people spend their lives. And it's, to me, it's tragic. So let's go from there. And I will never, well, maybe I can pronounce this right, but who were the Hemerodromoi? <laughs> <laughs> Hammer of the wrong knee. Yeah. <laughs> I got none of that right, so, but the yeah. left. <laughs> <laughs> um, they were, uh, Hammer of the wrong knee are basically day long runners. And they were professional foot messengers in ancient Greece. Mm -hmm. So in ancient Greece, they realized that in the hilly terrain, 
um, a, a, a runner could outrun a horse. And the Greeks thought our strategic advantage, because we have fewer men to, you know, to, to put into the military, especially than Persia, um, our strategic battle advantage uh, and military advantage would be that we can deploy these foot messengers quicker than horses to gather information, to disperse information, to collect intelligence, and so forth. So they trained these runners, and they were professionally paid runners, to run great distances in as short amount of time as possible. In fact, Pheidippides or Pheidippides or Philippides, um, his uh, the translation of his name means spare the horse, because he could outrun a horse and not kill. You'd spare a horse, you wouldn't kill a horse. You'd just have this foot messenger run and disperse information instead. They do, don't they? Still have a few. I think there was Leadville in the past. Maybe well, although that's a, that's a mule race. But I've heard of races where you will literally the runners are matched up against horse and rider, and sometimes the runners win. Yeah, I, I've been one of those runners. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. There's a, there's Tell a, us about it. Yeah. Well, there's a there's a race called the Vermont Trail 100 mile endurance run in Vermont, mm -hmm. and it's a concurrent horse race. And I actually. I, I actually won the race the year I did it, but I, I beat the horses as well. I was first overall man or horse, and that. But you know, I, I don't want to say like I'm special in that way. That's that's a phenomenon that's happened before as well. Mm -hmm. Well, we probably have an easier time going up and down really rocky, steep, loose terrain than a four legger would. Well, there's a couple. There's a couple things as well. It's um, that we can sweat. Oh. Animals that have fur are not as good as dispersing heat. So a horse, as you know, can outsprint us, but eventually generates so much body heat they have to slow down. Where we're more efficient at um, at cooling ourselves, and I think that's one of the theories. There, there are a couple of theories why a man cannot run a horse. So tell us, what is uh, sea buckthorn berries? <laughs> that's the secret potion of the ancient Hemer of the Romi. Um, they it's going to be the new chia seed. <laughs> Yeah, no, they're amazing, um, and I'm surprised they're not more widely known, but it's a little berry that grows in certain terrains in Greece, in mm -hmm. very salty terrains, so down by the seashore, and they're amazing. That's one of the only, it, it is actually the only um, edible fruit or of any sort of food source that has omega-3, omega-6, and omega-9 fatty acids, so there's something like 150 bioavailable substances in sea buckthorn, and the ancient Greeks used to eat this uh, as an energy source. And the reason they, they did this, it was actually um, Alexander the Great who noticed that when his horses uh, were sick, they used to eat this berry, mm -hmm. and there's, they, it used to make them healthy again. And he thought, wow, there's something about this berry that's, that's got uh, medicinal properties. So he started eating it, and all of a sudden he felt better. And all the ancient Greeks used to eat it. Yeah. Sea buckthorn berry. What do you think the first time you ate it? <laughs> I want to spit it out. It's, <laughs> it's really astringent. It's kind of an acquired taste. So it does have notes of sweetness, mm -hmm. um, but it's, uh, it's very bitter and tart at first. It really wakes you up, that's for sure. It brings your mouth to life. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. So tell us, how did you end up in Greece the first time? And, and what was the experience when you first got there, sleep deprived and all? Yeah, so if you know my lifestyle, it's um, I'm running a race almost every weekend, either a marathon or an ultra marathon. It's been that way for the last few years. And about six years ago, I, uh, I ran the Chicago Marathon and had a flight later that afternoon to Athens. So I uh, ended up getting kind of stuck at the finish line, um, ran to my hotel, <laughs> literally ran because I couldn't get a cab. The streets were crowded. I uh, didn't even shower. I uh, went to O'Hare, got on a flight. Uh, the flight was delayed. I missed my connection in Amsterdam. I eventually got to Athens after about 35 hours of travel time. After just having run the Chicago Marathon. Oh, not muscle showering. cramps. <laughs> oh, it was the flight was horrible. Sleep deprived. And I got to Athens, and I just thought, get me to the hotel. I cannot wait to fall asleep. And I got to the hotel, and I was pulling the blind shut. It was, it was right about at sunset. And I remember looking out the window briefly. And, and if you've ever been to Athens uh, and looked up at the Acropolis, it, it's something spiritual about it. I mean, it, 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 it just owns you in a certain way. And I saw the Acropolis up on this hill, 
and it was lit by the you know the setting sunlight. I thought I've got to go to this place. Uh, so I just laced up my running shoes and and ran up there. It was about a two mile run, I would say, from my hotel. And I got up there right when the sun was setting. Wow. And yeah, and again, if you've been to the Acropolis, there's just something so powerful about this place. Uh, and it just, I had a moment with God. I don't know how else to explain it. It, it was like an epiphany, uh, almost like a deja vu. Like I'm meant to be standing here right now at this moment in time. I've never had a feeling like that before in my entire life. I've never felt like that since that point until, unless I'm back in Greece. But it was just a, such a profound moment. Like this is where I'm meant to be. And it, it was it was shocking. It just, it, it you know, it's, again, it was like nothing I'd experienced before. And I don't imagine many people have, have you ever had an experience like that? Not in the way you're describing. It, 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 it melts you like, wow, I'm supposed to be standing here right now in this place. And it was a place halfway around the world. Well, to me, it, the experience from what you're describing, it, it links you in space and time. You're there, there, and clearly you're there several thousand years before there, and maybe at some point in the future as well. Yeah, I, I, again, I've never, I'd never, you know, and this, I was 50 years old when that happened. You know, in, in 50 years, I'd never felt anything even remotely close to the feeling I felt when I was standing right there. If we fast forward from there, you've had some very special experiences in, in Greece. And I want to get into the race here in a, in a brief second. But um, a bell at your great-grandmother's home as well. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, it, <laughs> the, the one thing that's kind of shocking about Greece is um, there certainly there are areas that are developed. But there are certain other areas that are the same way they've been for centuries, if not thousands of years, millennial. So, you know, when I went back to this village uh, and I met, you know, these, these old relatives of mine, it was, it was amazing to think that, you know, my grandfather and my grandmother had lived in this very house that still stood. It was like a, an old Greek house and no one had lived there for years. And so I went inside. Yeah. And you found, uh, uh, at risk of the roof falling, but you found an old bell that was probably rung by your great-grandmother. Exactly. And, you know, I, I, it was amazing. And there's a photo of it in the book. So I found this bell just sitting in the side of this. You know, you have to imagine this is a white structure in the hills of Greece. So, and no one had been in there for 20, 30, 40 years. And here I find this old bell. And they, they thought that maybe that was the bell my my great great grandmother used to summons my great grandfather for dinner. Wow! How did Greece change you? You know, the Greek Greece is an enigma. It's very hard to describe Greece because uh, it's such a diverse and conflicted place. I mean, we know of the economic hardships that Greece is suffering now. We know about the refugee crisis that Greece is suffering right now. But there's something about the Greek spirit that that endures these things, and it's it's hard to describe. I mean, the Greeks are never beyond just saying, <laughs> "Let's have some Greek dancing and a shot of ouzo." No matter how bad things are are in life, they're never beyond laughing and kind of embracing each other and just taking a moment to celebrate being alive. And I don't know what it is. We we just don't seem to do that in America. I mean, we take things so seriously. Uh, and we're, we are very conflicted here. But in Greece, that same sort of conflict, it, it doesn't seem as intense. It still seems like there's a sense of community and belonging uh, with, with all the Greek people. I love it. When you were over there, you had, and, and I'm guessing you came back for a second trip, but you, you had an idea at some point in your mind having to do with one of the many pronunciations of Pheodipides. <laughs> What what were you what were you thinking or hoping or scheming or planning, um, and what did you begin doing the summer of two thousand fourteen? Yeah, so I learned the true story of what really happened, at least as best we know it, uh, with the marathon, and that story was that prior to the Battle of Marathon, Phidippides was dispatched from Athens to run to Sparta. Now, if you've ever seen the movie 300, you know, who's the most badass fighting force in ancient Greece? The Spartans, right? You know, this is Sparta. So he was dispatched to run there to recruit them in the battle. Now, that's about 150 miles. 
So I thought, this is beyond the marathon. I mean, we know a marathon is 26.2 miles. Um, where did he run? How did he accomplish this? Uh, let's go do some research. Let's see if you can recreate this actual original run through the hills of Greece. So that's what I did. I set about recreating this footpath to kind of reenact uh, this original marathon, which was actually an ultra marathon that took place 2,500 years ago. And to do that, I worked with the foremost authority in ancient Greek culture uh, from Cambridge University, Dr. Paul Cartledge, mm -hmm. as well as a uh, professor, Dr. P.J. Shaw, who actually had written a research paper on the pathway of Phytopedes. And it's really the foremost um, research paper on the subject, one of the only research papers that exists on the subject. And she outlined the course that he probably took uh, in that run 2,500 years ago. And so you scoped it out. You tried to do as many sections of it as you could. You ended up running home, home, so to speak, many days with a watermelon. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> uh, during during my research, I, you know, I'd have to exit the trails because I was off in the hills. You got to picture the hillsides of Greece that haven't changed in 2,500 years. I'm up there, you know, running off in these mountains for, you know, 30, 40, 50 miles at a time. But where I exited the, the trail, if you will, and came out into the road, there was a, a little store there, like a convenience store, if you will. And the shopkeeper there took a liking to me. And she, you know, the Greeks are very giving people. So she would bestow me every time I ran by with a watermelon. <laughs> and Greeks do that all the time. They give watermelons as gifts. They grow, the watermelon are delicious, by the way, and they grow wild. So I think they were growing in her backyard. Every time she'd see me run by, she'd hand me a watermelon. And I still had like, you know, a few miles to go to get back to my hotel. And I felt so guilty, like I have to carry this watermelon back. So I tried to carry like a rugby ball, you know, I'd put it over the back of my neck. And man, at the end of my uh, my research, uh, in, you know, my reconnaissance in the, in the hills of Greece, I had like a dozen watermelons stacked up in my hotel room. That's funny. And, and she was strengthening you because it's not a power bar. You ain't throwing that in your pocket. <laughs> so, well, you know, it, it, I mean, to explain this to an American audience, it sounds crazy, doesn't it? That someone gives you a watermelon, you know, when you run by their shop. But uh, that's the way, if you get into the countryside of Greece, it's, it's still the way things are conducted. It's awesome. And that's total, to accept that, that is a gift. You're giving her a gift by accepting it as well. <laughs> and carrying it for she has no idea what I went through. Believe me. No. Yeah. So so you scouted out the course. It sounds like, or you scouted out his path. And at the end of the day, you kind of throw your hands up and go. Time has maybe changed too much, but then you wanted to do what's called, if I get it right, the Spartathlon. Yeah. So when I tried to reenact the actual footpath, uh, it was impossible. You know, so much of the area he ran on is now completely overgrown, so it's it's unnavigatable. And there are dissecting goat paths. There's there's so many different options that I could not actually recreate that very pathway that he took. But there is a race that you mentioned called the Spartathlon, which is uh, as close a reenactment as possible to what Fidipides did. And this. Spartathlon is a 153-mile foot race mm -hmm. from Athens to, to uh, Sparta. A lot of it is on the road, though, so it doesn't actually follow the, uh, the exact route that he took, but it's pretty close proximity. And I won't give away the whole race. Everybody, you're going to want to go out and get the road to Sparta to find out about the race and to find out about... Uh, how do you pronounce it? What's your best pronunciation? I would say... Phidippides. Phidippides, and find that, out about yeah. Phidippides. But I will touch on a couple highlights for people. What in the world is cataleptic nocturnal locomotion? <laughs> well, one thing with the Spartathlon, this is a brutal race. So not only is it 153 miles, there are really aggressive cutoff times because it stays with the historical record that we have from Herodotus who reported about Phidippides. So, for instance, you have to be at the 50.22 mile mark in sub nine and a half hours or else you get pulled from the race. And not only is it 50.22 miles, it's a, it's a tough 50.22 miles. It's hilly, it's hot, but these, these cutoff times stay that aggressive throughout the course of the race. You have to complete the race in 36 hours uh, or else you're eliminated. So the, basically the, the course is closed in 36 hours. 
which requires you to run straight through the night. There's no way around it. And the phenomena you just uh, described is, uh, in layperson's terms, sleep running. <laughs> so I woke up in the middle of the road uh, running, and I realized, wow, I was asleep and I was running. And I kind of looked back and thought, you know, you covered quite a distance while you were asleep. And I just willed myself. I so much wanted to complete this race. It became so personal to me that I just willed myself to keep going and while I was asleep. And then uh, the other, way, other key one is you were running at one point and you're looking down at a runner way, way down below you. And I was wondering if you could share about that briefly. Well, I will tell you that um, a couple things. This was not a good race. And I think that makes the story interesting. If I had had a good race, I would have just written a race report. Like, yeah, it went great. It was typical. You know, I hit my splits. This was just the opposite. Things fell apart. And I got it in my head that I'm either going to finish this race mm -hmm. or they're going to take me out of here in an ambulance. I am not going to stop. I mean, it's like my grandfather cutting off his arm. Like, I'm either going to cut off my arm or I'm going to finish this race. So I was running along and... My electrolytes are completely out of balance. You know, I am dehydrated. I'm sleep deprived. Well, if I, if I pause, you, pause you for a second, if I understand right, you were passing through, I picture the Greece countryside of really clean air, but you kept on hitting these pockets, these factories that was just noxious. Yeah, well, that's the other thing with Greece is so conflicted. I mean, there were certain areas that are so beautiful. The coast is incredible. And there's other areas where you're running through refineries and you're breathing in this toxic air, which was really making me nauseous. So I wasn't the only one who was nauseous. I saw a lot of other runners throwing up on the roadside and kind of dealing with that, that industrial pollution. But this now is, you know, this is after about 30 hours of running. So I'd gotten beyond that, that point near Athens where all the pollution was. And as I'm running, you know, the best I could describe it is, is imagine a praying mantis, a little bug. I saw a praying mantis just running along down by my feet on the road, like a little army man, just moving along. And, I, and I'm looking at this kind of stick figure, thinking, what is that thing? I'm thinking I'm seeing a bug down below me. And all of a sudden, it dawned on me, that's me down there. I'm looking down at myself. And, you know, I'm, I'm not a religious guy, but I would consider that an out-of-body experience. I don't know how else to describe it. But I was looking down at myself from a different position. It was as though I was in a helicopter or an air balloon just hovering above myself as I was looking down at this runner being me. Wow. How has overall, all the years of running that you've done, how has that changed you and what, what lessons have you learned from that? Not that you can summarize it in one or two lessons. You know, I, I've learned that we're, we're better than we think we are, and we can typically go further than we think we can. And running is very symbolic in that regard. I mean, uh, if you're not a runner, you can set a goal of running a 5K. And if you complete a 5K, you can say, well, maybe I'll try a 10K. And if you complete that, you might say, wow, maybe I'll tackle a half a marathon. And if you complete a half marathon, you might say, maybe I can do a marathon. And then if you finish that, you might say, maybe I can do an ultra marathon. So in running, you can see quantifiably yourself improve. And I think as that happens, you, you actually teach yourself that, wow, this is something that I never thought I could accomplish. And you accomplish it. And it's re again, it's very quantifiable. And I think that lesson you can apply to anything in your life. It, it moves beyond running into interpersonal relationships, into business, everywhere else. Woohoo! And, and <laughs> I always like to ask for Still running people, yeah. <laughs> I always like to ask for a homework assignment to give to people, and maybe that's what you're saying it would be is to challenge us to what well, what would you say? Well, I mean for a newbie runner, I always say try to run continuously for three minutes. And I know to someone who's you know, like saying this to you, you're thinking well, three minutes, what is that? But I work with a lot of runners of all different levels, and a lot of people, when they're first starting out, find it very challenging to run continuously for three minutes. You know what they typically do? They, they sprint it out, and after 45 seconds to a minute, they're so out of breath, they have to stop. 
So I say, if you try to regulate your pace so that you can run continuously for three minutes. And when you get there, try five minutes. You know, and when you can run continuously for 10 minutes, try to run a 5K, you know, 3.1 miles continuously. Try to regulate your pace so you can run that distance continuously and then build from there. Awesome. What advice would you give today to parents to help their kids start to, for lack of another term, come to life more? <laughs> well, I've got kids, and I'll tell you what. Um, <laughs> and and how you, old? Uh, I'm, well, they're older now. I've got um, a, a teenage son, and my daughter now is uh, in her early 20s. So, yeah, they're older. Um, but I learned when they were younger, as soon as you tell them to do something, uh, they do the exact opposite. So, <laughs> You know, you can't tell a kid to do something. Uh, what you can do is you can lead by example. And I think the best thing a parent can do is, is lead by example. Uh, if they want their kids to embrace life more, they have to embrace life more. If they want their kids to eat better, they have to eat better. If they want their kids to exercise, <laughs> they have to exercise. So I think as a parent, um, leading by example is the best thing you can do. They are watching you. <laughs> From there, why did you write this book specifically, Road to Sparta, and where can people go to find out more? Yeah, so this, this is my fourth book, and um, this, I think, is my most personal book. And it, yeah, thank you for that shameless plug. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, well, it's, it's, it's awesome, and we haven't really gone into the story. We think of the story as the marathon as 26 or so miles. In fact, we find out here is what, what 24.8, but... He had run 153 miles beforehand. <laughs> Nobody told us that. <laughs> no. But, I, I, you know, beyond just the story of what the marathon is really about, and I think anyone who's, who sets out to run a marathon, or even a half marathon, owes it to themselves um, to read this book because it gives deeper meaning and purpose to what we do, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. It shows that uh, there's such lore and history behind what we're doing. It just makes you feel better about doing what you're doing. Um, but I think that uh, this book, it goes beyond running, right? It transcends running. I mean, it Definitely. speaks to um, finding who you are, uh, learning about yourself. And I think that, that that is a theme that we see this day uh, and age, um, people searching for more than ever. We see things like Ancestry.com or 23andMe, where you can learn about your roots and where you came from. And this story talks about one man's quest to find out who he is. And I think that anyone can read this and say, wow, I want to I take this journey myself, or they can relate to this journey I've taken on certain levels themselves. But it ties it all back to kind of the ancient Greek uh, principles of um, arete, you know, balance of mind, body, and spirit, as well as the idea of uh, physical bestness being uh, absolutely imperative to living life to its fullest. Woohoo! <laughs> you got a, a a website URL for people. Um, you know, if they go to ultramarathonman.com, dot com, mm -hmm. uh, you can learn more about me. You can see if you want to order the book. You can order. Um, you know, I listen to the audio version. I, I know a lot of runners that like audio books, so um, you can order the audio book, or you can get a you know a an ebook or a hard copy. Awesome. And last two questions I've got is, um, first off, what personally brings you the greatest happiness or what I call the woohoo factor? <laughs> you know, to me, it's, it's, it's nothing does it for me like a physical challenge. I mean, you know, it, you, you can get degrees, you know, you can get, uh, you know, you can close business deals, whatever. That feels kind of good. But I mean, even just, I, I don't want to say even running a marathon, but just even getting to the finish of a mar marathon. <laughs> Only <today>. you, Dean. <laughs> yeah, a, a little sprint race like a marathon. Uh, accomplishing something uh, of, of great physical difficulty brings me the greatest reward and greatest feeling of fulfillment. Oh, awesome. Any last words of wisdom you want to share with people today? You know, the one thing I always tell people, especially um, new runners and, uh, you know, a lesson I learned running the Spartathlon, uh, as well as just getting through a day, getting through life, is you know you you don't have to go fast. Uh, you just have to go. And I think the proverb was that um, uh, be not afraid of going slowly. Uh, be afraid only of standing still. So I encourage people, as tough as it is sometimes, keep putting one foot in front of the other. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you. This has been awesome, Dean. I, I love having you on the show. I love following what you've done. And um, you bring a large amount of heart to whatever <laughs> you do. Well, thank you. It's just who I am. Yeah. Thank you so much. So for everyone out there, this is Michael Sandler saying, be well, have fun, get the road to Sparta, and consider starting training today, and shine bright. <laughs> woo <laughs> Thank you so much, Dean. Hey, you're a great interviewer. Thanks for having me on. Great energy. Thanks for keeping the pace going. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed it, be sure to like, like below. Also, leave your comments. Have some real fun with it. Subscribe to our channel where you're going to get more great videos, more interviews coming up. And check out our website, InspireNationShow.com. That's where you'll find tips, blogs, information, videos you won't find anywhere else, and useful and helpful resources to really help you kickstart your life and to shine bright. Thanks so much again. Thank you for your support. Like, 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 comment, subscribe. See the website. Thanks so much and have fun. Of course, shine bright. Woohoo! <laughs>